as we move away from a world in which the air is unfit to breathe and our food is unfit to eat. It's good to know that whatever raging debates there are about whether EVs are cleaner or not, I mean they are, it's just ridiculous propaganda. Anyway, or whether climate change is real, I mean it just is. We can at least be comfortable knowing that literally no one thinks that lousy air quality is a good thing and that everyone understands that cleaning up pollution is a great way to save lives, reduce long-term illness and cut the cost of healthcare. Weir has no idea what he's talking about. This doesn't kill anybody, this doesn't make anybody cough, this is not a health event. Oh for fuck's sake! When the fossil fuel lobby is desperately flailing for yet another talking point about how EVs aren't really clean because something something coal, something something Koch brothers, and you know bathing in motor oil is good for you anyway, strengthens the bones, they press hard on the at the tailpipe bit of zero emissions at the tailpipe. And then they ramble incoherently about pollution from power plants because everyone knows that gas car exhausts are bad for you and that EVs, whatever pollution they may cause during manufacturing, and we have a whole playlist about the disinformation around that, they leave no fumes and little to no brake particulates when they're driving along. So it's important to muddy those clean waters. But even when the fossil fuel lobby does that, they're admitting that what Uncommon Sense dictates is true, which is that there will be less pollution in and around the environment where the car is being used if that car is an EV. And since, unlike a fossil fuel vehicle, it's possible to power the car entirely from renewable energy sources, there can be less pollution once it hits the road, the benefits can extend further. But today we're just going to be focusing on that little world, the town or city where the car is being used, and we have the first little piece of evidence that EVs and transportation electrification has an outsized impact on the health of urban dwellers. Now over the years we've seen a wide range of models used to try and identify the positive and negative impacts on the air in our cities, because and I really feel like I shouldn't have to say this, pollution is bad. There's the various gases that come out of vehicle exhausts, carcinogenic compounds, NOx, sulphur dioxide, ozone, and of course carbon monoxide, on top of which there are the coarse and fine particulates referred to as PM10 and PM2.5. PM2.5 because they're smaller than 2.5 microns across. Those are small enough to make their way into your lungs and beyond the immediate impacts on your lung health, we also know from peer-reviewed public health research that they're linked to higher rates of heart attacks, strokes and respiratory and immune responses, whatever industry-funded lobbyists might like you to think. And since our Fox TV mate seems to think that huffing soot is good for him, I think this might be a good moment to look at what the science actually says about the impacts of the pollution that's generated as a result of burning fossil fuels in cities is. Obviously the challenge here is that you're looking at a large number of individuals and they are not all perfectly healthy. They're not only engaging in supping kale smoothies through a sterile straw, or indeed engaging in Klingon calisthenics on the holodeck. Computer. Level two. People smoke, they maybe don't get enough exercise, perhaps they're working a 70 hour work week spread across four minimum wage jobs and they're just a tiny, tiny bit stressed. Perhaps even chamomile tea would not help. Anyhow, studies consistently show that even after adjusting for these factors, pollution can increase risks in pregnancy. Short-term exposure to pollution is closely linked to COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, in case you didn't know, shortness of breath, asthma, generalized respiratory disease, and high rates of hospitalization. That's a measure that's often used to examine impacts that lead to illness. 
The long-term effects associated with air pollution have been found to include chronic asthma, pulmonary insufficiency that's more lung problems by the way, heart diseases, and dying because of heart diseases. According to a Swedish cohort studies, diabetes also seems to be correlated with long-term air pollution exposure. Now I don't know about right-wing types because it does seem like we have pretty different definitions of fun, but none of these things sound fun to me, and I'd rather avoid them as far as possible. And you know, I know that as a low meat diet eating irritatingly, exercise is good for you actually, liberal lefty, but with my medical hat on I'm gonna say you want to avoid those health impacts. So across the world pollution modelling is a fairly common thing to do because we want to reduce and minimise exposure to it. And the complexities of that modelling are pretty intense. Say for example you're thinking about building a subway, you might just assume that building a subway, at least one powered by electricity, would move people out of cars and onto underground trains, and Roberta's your uncle, you've got a reduction in pollution from vehicles. But when you're modelling that, you also have to account for the fact that, well, if there's less traffic, other people might start to decide to use those roads that have been emptied of at least some of your commuters, because now it's actually easier to drive into the city you might end up with more people coming in and doing stop-start journeys. What if, because of the location of the stations, more people drive into the outskirts of the city, or from one point in the city to another, because they can get from that location to the city centre more easily? And then there are questions like, how does the density of your planned subway stops impact ridership, and thus pollution? Those things are expensive to build. It turns out that unsurprisingly, in the case of Beijing, which is one of the studies we link to down there, even with the other shifts in usage, the planned subway expansion modelling did suggest it would improve air quality and reduce mortality and morbidity. But the authors were interested to note that healthcare savings would only amount to around 3% of the build cost. So if that was your only benefit, you might not deem it worth it. Ok, so if getting people onto trains would reduce emissions in cities, then presumably similar findings would have been seen in EV modelling. Well, sort of yes. To pick two at random, one study looking at the deployment of EVs in Turin, Italy, and the other looking at fleet electrification across all of China, both of these studies looked to try and model the impacts of a reduction in pollution. In the Italian study, its endpoint showed around an 87% reduction in NOx and a 36% reduction in large particulates, and a 50% reduction in fine particulates by 2030. And combining short and long-term impacts, that leads to avoiding around 400 deaths and over a thousand hospitalizations just for the city's population annually. The Chinese study had similarly strong findings. Widespread electrification would mean that by 2030 nationwide 17,456 deaths could be avoided. And additionally a 2019 paper suggested that air pollution causes considerable mortality even in areas previously thought to have good air quality. For example in 2018 outdoor air pollution caused 84,300 deaths in Italy and 78,400 in Germany, 47,300 in France and 41,900 in the UK. And that kind of impact is reflected in the fact that last year the American Lung Association's Zeroing on Healthy Air report shared that a widespread shift to zero emission transportation could yield more than 1.2 trillion dollars in health benefits and avoid 110,000 deaths. Ok, so pretty much universally we're thinking that overall modelling of the EV transition shows an improvement in air quality in cities, although it would be remiss of me not to say that the transition is not without trade-offs, especially if certain states decide to cling with a death grip to their fossil fuel generation capacity. Because while EVs are cleaner, even when powered by coal, if states refuse to invest in cleaner energy sources then those states that are 
reliant on fossil fuel generation may actually see worse air quality in some areas as pollution that's currently created in far distant refineries comes back home to roost in the form of energy generation within the state and that could have a negative impact on the life expectancy of people in those states. Although since a lot of those states also seem to be hell-bent on driving medical professionals out of the state by meddling in what healthcare they can deliver, well, they might have other problems anyway. Anyhow, as I said at the jump, we've now got the first paper that I've seen looking at the actual impact of electrification on air quality and it is impressive. Indeed, given the predicted mortality and morbidity decreases from the modeling, it suggests that environmental pollution is frankly significantly more damaging to human and probably animal health than we previously thought. Now, of course, this does come with the caveat that the world is a complex place and many things changed between 2013 and 2019. That's the survey period, incidentally. So trying to identify exactly what caused any specific change is going to be well, hard. So with that in mind, let's look at the changes to the environment. During the survey period, EV adoption went from 1.4 zero emission vehicles per thousand people to 14.7 vehicles per thousand people overall. And in that same period, annual average nitrogen dioxide levels dropped by 0.41 parts per billion. Interestingly, the study notes that the air quality monitoring sites were actually in zip codes with lower EV adoption, so the actual drop in areas with higher adoption may have been significantly larger. And the impact of that? Well, within a zip code, an increase of just 20 zero emission vehicles per thousand population was associated with a drop in asthma-related emergency department attendances of 3.2%. For those statisticians in the audience, that's at a 95% confidence interval and a p-value of 0.006, which for those non-statisticians in the audience means it's a pretty good bet that the improved air quality resulted in fewer emergency department visits and that the improvement in air quality is also probably down to the EVs. Now, the authors are keen to point out that this data has a number of restrictions. The take-up of EVs has been highly inequitable. The resulting impacts are really driven by several specific zip codes with markedly higher adoption rates to take but two. But even when you exclude that data, the connection to reduced emergency department attendances for asthma remains statistically significant. And that is super exciting. In 2019, plug-in sales in California made up about just 6% of total market share for new vehicles. And while it's likely we'll see a tailing off effect on health as the percentage of gas cars dwindles, it gives me a lot of hope that for that first chunk of time in this transition, we're going to see some really rapid improvements in human and potentially animal health. Of course, the challenge is that these improvements aren't going to be equally received, with people in the lowest income brackets and with the worst health outcomes already being less likely to be able to electrify. Although electrification of bus fleets and heavy goods vehicles does mean that even in areas where there's less electric vehicle take up, there should hopefully be some of these benefits. So that's where we're at. The evidence suggests that electrification is bringing out size health benefits already and I think we can expect that to continue. Now all we need to do is keep the planet habitable long enough to enjoy the benefits. And on that note, we're done with today's video. If you have comments, drop us a polite note in the Discord chat room on Mastodon or if you're a Patreon supporter in the comments there. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell and follow the links below to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Ko-fi, Bitcoin and Swag store as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. Scrolling by on my right is the list of amazing charged up supporters and shout outs go to our V2G Patreon supporters Alan Tupper, Andrew Martin, Bennett Elder, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C, Hey Esker, John Trammell, Kyle Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Regine Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, Tessa in the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Kyle Hodgson, Chris Ascenter, Denny Hyde, Lance Charles, Linda Irish, Mike Weeder and Paul Nelson and finally big 
thanks to our off-grid supporters Paul Conway, Kevin Burrowbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Han, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin, JP Fagerback, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, CPU Freak 101, Eric Knack, Joe Bresney, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Nigel S, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and of course, Ian. There are also a bunch of extra people who I know signed up following our live stream a couple of weeks ago. Thank you so much. I know you're not on the list yet. You will be on the list. I just don't quite know when. It will be soon, I promise. And thank you so much for joining up. Don't forget we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Saturday on the main channel plus Sunday on Take Two. And with that, I hope you enjoyed the rest of your day. I'll see you soon. And as always, keep evolving. And now, just for a minute, I am going to talk about this since Nikki gets to talk about her um, Max. I'm going to talk about this. People have asked if this is a Scion, uh, Scion 2? 3, Scion 3. Uh, it is not. It is sort of a Scion 3. It is a Acorn Pocketbook 2. Um, I always wanted one of these when I was a kid, and it turns out I can buy them now. Um, the Acorn Pocket Books are made by Scion, or were made by Scion, powered by two AA batteries. Um, the Pocket Book 2 is a weird little beast. It looks like a 3C, but it's not quite a 3C. It's somewhere between a 3C and a 3MX. The screen is a 3MX screen. I know this because I bought a 3C, uh, I bought a 3C screen to replace this one because it was broken. Um, unfortunately, it looks like as I put it in, I managed to damage this one slightly, so it has a little bit of a sad LCD thing going on. But it may mostly works. I'm very pleased that I managed to get it working because it was completely dead pretty much when I got it. Um, what do I use it for? Well, I might use it for writing. Uh, not scripts, but other things. Um, but I need to get it connecting to um, a device like this. Probably my uh, framework laptop when it arrives. I have the cable. Um, but I haven't tested it out because it absolutely honks of cigarette smoke, which is a bit of a shame. It serves me right for not asking, but it, it was fairly cheap. Anyway, so that is my pocketbook too. I am an Acorn fan. These Mac things, they're all very fancy, but Acorn's where it's at. Sophie Wilson, absolutely stand the woman. <laughs>